interpreters, we do ask uh, to please remain muted when you're not speaking um, so that the interpreters can hear all of the information. Uh, we do encourage you to turn your videos on, uh, interact with us, and video is being taken today. Uh, the session will be recorded and will be posted on the uh, Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities website at a later date. With that said, um, photos, video, and audio recorded by attending this event uh, will be included. Um, so by sharing, you are giving DODD permission to share your image and your voice. Um, we'll jump into the agenda here. So we're going to start off with our family um, updates, our Ohio Life Course Nexus. Uh, then we will learn some, some things about the Ohio ISP, have some updates. Our Medicaid division will be sharing some information, and um, we'll have some time with our community life engagement team. Um, at the end of our session, we'll have some time with Director Hauk, uh, the director of the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, and um, we'll be able to share some information. So uh, why are we hosting Family Advisory Council? What is this meeting? Um, so it's an opportunity for families to learn about changes that impact um, the people in Ohio and people that are supported in Ohio. Um, and it's also an opportunity for us to hear from people living in Ohio uh, about your experiences. Your voice is valued and um, we really appreciate um, the experiences and the lives of folks in Ohio. So um, the intent of this time is for DODD administrative team to hear firsthand information from people um, focused on uh, many issues that affect people across Ohio. Um, and we wanna give everybody an opportunity to share what their experiences are. We have and... a connection to check. I'm sorry. Um, we wanna give folks an opportunity to share their experiences. And if there is a particular concern um, please reach out to us. We will be happy to connect with you. So I'm going to turn uh, the conversation over to the Ohio Life Course Nexus Statewide Manager, Corey Ferguson. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you very much for um, hosting this time together. One thing I wanted to share with everybody today was we are Really excited to let everyone know that we have expanded our Ohio Life Course Nexus team here at DODD. Um, it has been myself um, and Meredith doing family outreach and education, and Nate Turner as part of our team um, working in outreach and education as well, and supporting people who are served throughout our system. Um, recently, I'm excited to share that we have added Jeanette Welsh to our team, um, and she is focusing on housing supports and provides oversight for our rental assistance program and our 811 program and will continue to support us in helping people get connected with um, housing services and supports um, and be involved in a lot of our, our policy work here within the space of housing. Um, so we're really, really grateful for her who, um, for joining us. And then we have also um, had Tiffany Maddett in join us who um, used to be a member of our earlier intervention team and she has rejoined us at DODD um, to be our inclusive practice manager really looking at how our department as well as our system is being accessible and inclusive for all of the people that we serve. Um, both of them have started within the past few weeks, but we are particularly excited to welcome them to the team um, and they will continue to contribute to a lot of the work that our team at the Ohio Life Course Nexus does um, to move forward in supporting people with developmental disabilities as well as family members. So I did wanna take some time to uh, share that they have joined their team and we're super excited to have them aboard. So thanks, Meredith. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jeanette and Tiffany for joining us today. Um, we're so excited to have you as part of the team and help support people across Ohio. Um, Corey, if you would be so kind to drop um, their contact information 
um, or if folks want to reach out to us uh, or reach Jeanette and Tiffany, um, you, they, you can also reach out to the Ohio Life Course Nexus team and we will get the information and questions to them. So welcome aboard. Thank you and um, looking forward to this journey. So um, I am going to uh, pass the conversation on over to Beth Chambers uh, to give us some updates on the Ohio ISP and all the great things that we're doing in that space. Thanks so much, Meredith. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, we've um, been doing a lot of work with the Ohio ISP. We've been hearing from lots of people and uh, really just supporting people to um, begin implementation of Ohio ISP. My contact information was listed. Um, again, we just want to start from the beginning. Ohio ISP is a standardized assessment and planning template and process to be used throughout the state. We know that um, lots of 88 different counties were doing things their own way using different templates. Uh, ICFs, our intermediate care facilities, were using lots of different templates. And this is just streamlined things, um, made it easier to find the basics. Obviously a template is just um, a template. So what brings it to life is the good stuff that people puts that people put in the template. Um, and it's that person-centered, uh, rich, information that we learn about people and their families. Um, the person and their family drive the planning process. Again, really just using that template to standardize things and get people kind of level set and so that we can uh, focus on the really cool and interesting things about each of the people that we meet. And then the goal, Ohio ISP, one plan for all Ohioans. We want the same plan format and process. Uh, Ohio ISP content is individualized. I know in the beginning people said, if it's standardized, how can it be individualized and person-centered? Uh, just the template, just to the basics. Um, even that, um, there are standard questions within the assessment, the discovery assessment, that lead you down a path. You don't need to go uh, where you're not compelled to go, but really, um, you can ask more probing questions to get to know someone differently. So it really does bring the information to life. Um, online system available to teams, uh, all the information being in one place and the plan follows the person receiving services. So uh, moving from one county to another, once everyone is, is in the system using um, the plan format, it will allow people to uh, really catch up to speed. If I move from one county to another or from an intermediate care facility to a county board out in the community waiver setting, um, the plan information will look very similar and we can kind of catch up and update the, the specifics. So that, we're already seeing that happen. And then Ohio ISP can be used for anyone. Uh, people receiving waiver services and living in ICFs, this is just rule language, must have an Ohio ISP in the online system by June 30th, 2024. Um, we know that that's come and gone. We're now in September. Uh, but we did feel we wanted to give people proper planning time. So uh, we did allow uh, a little bit of an extension and a grace period. So no compliance citations will be issued for plans not being in the online system until January 1 of 2025. So that was to allow people to do the proper planning, to really um, get used to the, the process and feel comfortable. So we know a lot of people were, were really kind of stressed. So we, we wanted to give them some extra time. My team has been uh, working very closely with county board staff, with um, services support administrators and qualified intellectual disability professionals to really make sure those plan authors are comfortable and that teams are learning what to expect. And then we have some updated numbers. Um, and this is active, approved, or, or submitted status. So these are plans that are in effect. Um, 
waiver plans, uh, twenty over twenty two thousand, just at fifty percent. Um, intermediate care facilities, the ICFs, um, 2017, 47%. And our developmental centers are at 445, and that's 74% of completion. And we're just getting ready to pull the new numbers. I did not, unfortunately, have them for this uh, session, but we will be pulling those soon. And we post those on our webpage also. So, um, Look forward to that. We're making progress. We're really checking in with people, having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, helping them if they need help with implementation, getting plans in the system, and really kind of learning from their struggles, seeing how we can develop some standardized resources and provide some, some great support to teams to move forward. And then I just want to acknowledge, I we still hear sometimes that Ohio ISP it's long, it's cumbersome. Um, really want to remind people that uh, Ohio ISP is considered the plan, but it's also takes into account three specific components. And that's the introduction page, the plan, and the assessment. Um, and then if we could go to the next slide, please. Meredith, thank you. Um, the introduction, that's just how any of us would want to be introduced, how we would introduce a friend or a family member, um, making sure that people have the, the basic information that they would need at hand at a glance. An assessment, it's ongoing learning through casual conversation with the person and their family. We're constantly listening, learning, and um, gathering that information that changes just because we're people, we're human. And then uh, just discovering what the person needs and wants, really focusing on their strengths and abilities, identifying any risks, and obviously how, how the team can mitigate those, what's important to and important for the person, and then making sure that the plan, that the plan is driven by that rich assessment information and that it's focused on what the person and their family um, and the team is agreeing to, did we capture all that priority information from the assessment? Are we agreeing to this? And then, you know, making sure that everyone understands how we're going to implement. In Ohio ISP, I think the most important thing I can say to you all today is uh, reach out to your SSA or the QIDP for information on what to expect, timelines for transitioning to Ohio ISP, Pretty much everyone's using the template, but it might be um, good for you to know, like, when could I see my plan in the system? If you need help and assistance, we have uh, people ready, willing, and able to help you with that. Um, but as I said, the timelines, not all plans will be in the system, the online system, until after January 1 of 2025. So your uh, local, the service and support administrator, or that QIDP is going to be able to help you um, navigate and kind of know what to expect at the next step. We do have some upcoming trainings. Uh, the one I wanted to talk about today, um, assessment, let's start from the beginning. We're thrilled to be partnering with NISONGER and it really goes over the basic assessment training for services support administrators. And it's side by side with people with lived experience. So we're really opening up registration for teams um, to come up to four people. So it's, you know, the person and, you know, a family member or their direct support professional, uh, a family member um, can all benefit from some of that. So we'll have some in its a virtual session, followed up with an in-person session where we kind of put things into practical application, put them into practice, uh, get people ready. Um, so we're really happy to look at that from all angles. I think we'd I think the title kind of says it all. Really want to get back to the basics and let's start from the beginning and make sure that we're engaging in the right conversations at the right time. Any questions? I have a question if you're ready. Sure. Hi, Hi, Amy, how are you? 
Good, thank you. Thank you everybody for this information. Um, I'm getting some feedback from families that I wanna share and maybe you can provide insight. Okay. Uh, when families contact us, they're asking about the Britco signature page system mm -hmm. where their SSA is sending them the signature email slash Britco um, system without sending them, without seeing the IS, the new Ohio ISP. So families are just getting the Britco signature request, but they can't also see the new Ohio ISP online. So how are we bridging that? Because families, as you can probably imagine, don't want to sign something that they Absolutely. can't Absolutely. So what do you recommend for that? I recommend, well, I think it's very good that you brought that up. Um, it's Wednesday and we uh, we certainly have ongoing communication with our vendors, the Britco um, contacts. We meet with them regularly. So we will ask that. And we we have had this conversation in the past and I, I had, to my knowledge, it had been resolved where we were absolutely saying that no one's going to be expecting to sign a plan that they haven't seen Um or they're agreeing to the plan. So they have to be able to see that that latest version. So I will work on that and I will get um, some responses because I, I really did think that that had been resolved. So I appreciate oh you bringing it up today. No, I'm actually, it's fresh on my mind because some it happened again last week. Okay. Yes, the, there is no expectation that, um, and even if it's not in a finalized state, like if there's something with the online system where, you have to have something that you're reacting to. So this should be the finalized. There should be that correspondence that it hasn't been transmitted to DODD yet, but we are, this is the final agreed upon plan or the final version. We're asking for your sign off. There should be some language. So we will, we will firm that up and I will get some information uh, out on that. Thank you. And Amy, Thank if you, you have anything, I'm just going to add to what Beth said. If there is any that fresh in your mind example that happened yesterday, yeah. if there is anything like you would be comfortable like sending us so that we can tan we can show Brit Co. Like this is the email that the family's getting and it's the email requesting the signature and it has no documentation. It just helps in the conversation so that there's no confusion. If you aren't comfortable sending us an example, that's fine. But any okay. even screenshots that you can send yeah. us, it would be great. Um, okay. Like Beth said, with the Ohio ISP, there are those three components, the introduction, the discovery assessment, and the ISP. You have to see the ISP to confirm it is correct before actually signing it. And so we definitely want to work that out because you shouldn't be getting requesting a signature without actually seeing the document. So, but anything like physically you can show us so okay. as we have those conversations, because just for you all to know, with Ohio ISP, it is that standardized document, but the way that the county boards, the technology that they can use, it is different. They do have an ability to use different vendors, and Britco is one of them. And so we are, as Beth said, talking with them on a regular basis to make sure our technology applications are all in alignment um, and then ultimately, they will all sit in the Ohio ISP online system, which is a DODD program um, and that is a DODD application. Um, but they're not all in there yet in regards to being able to see it. But you need to see it prior to signature and you will see it in our system after signature. So um, okay. thank you, Amy, so, for bringing that up. But again, any oh, screenshots yeah, you can send us of what families are receiving would be really helpful. Who do you want besides you, Stacy? Who else should get that email? It, it, it Beth can, once you send it to her, she can take it and you can always CC me. Um, but yep. Beth is the main priority to get those screenshots, Amy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Beth. Um, and I know Corey is working on chat, so if you can share Beth's email or the Ohio ISP email. So thank you for that question. And um, I appreciate the feedback and being able to get some uh, some specific examples. I know our teams are excited to 
to help folks. So um, I do see that there is a question in the chat um, from Carolyn, and I'm going to read it. Um, where do we find the ISP online? Um, we can certainly show you the template if you're asking about the questions, but um, I think to the the point, you can reach out to your SSA or Q to see if the, the plan is in the online system available, um, the finalized plan, because as we said, people do have until that January 1, 2025 to enter the plans. We are happy to, to work with you if there's any questions, but really um, we can put the... Um, Oh, the web page is already in there. Thank you, Corey. Um, but yes, there is an online word version of if it's about the questions. And Beth, I'm just going to add again. So when you guys talk about the Ohio ISP online, so this is all of our words, right? Ohio ISP online to us is it's when the plan is sitting in the DODD system, okay? And the county boards, according to... Um, and, and our intermediate care facilities are both responsible for anybody living in an intermediate care facility and anyone who's on a home and community-based waiver. Okay, so if you sit out of those two categories, an actual Ohio ISP is not required. You may be experiencing it, but it's not required. Our rule requires for anybody on a home and community-based waiver and anybody in an ICF is to have an Ohio ISP and it needs to be in our system by that January 1st timeline. So um, you're currently experiencing it right now when we're getting all those plans loaded. So once we get plans loaded, we will go over with you guys how, like all of you, how you can get into our system and get a plan. But what's important to keep in mind is that plan will be accessible to you, but it is after you've worked with your county board and after you've worked with your intermediate care facility in that plan. And so you can access it to take it to different, if you're going to different counties, if you wanna access it after you've formally signed it, that's where you'll get it in our system and we're gonna go over that with you. We've kind of held that training for just a, a little bit because you've gotta make sure that you have access to the plan and you can sign that plan prior to when it's sent to us. Does that make sense? And so that's why Beth is, and hopefully this is helpful, encouraging you to go back to your service and support administrator to go back to the QIDP and say, I need, how am I going to get this plan? Because you need it before you're signing it. And so you do have that process does have to be worked out um, with your county board or your ICF so that you can sign the plan. And then we're going to go over training on how to get it in our DODD system after that, because that all has to be done before it actually comes, like before it comes to us and you guys, you guys can get, you families can get it, if that makes sense. So more to come um, and just a great question. And, and really, I mean, I feel like these questions are related to how do I experience an Ohio ISP? How do I get it before my signature and how do I get access to it after? Um, and so we'll definitely, because of your feedback, um, Amy, um, as well, and, and be able to give you some more examples as well. Hopefully that helps. Um, so I'm finding in my child's ISP that, you know, we'll be talking, we'll be working together, trying to write down the plan. But then the uh, SSA will say things like, oh, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to write that. Or, hmm, like I have to I have to go seek guidance from somewhere else to know how to make sure we're putting this in correctly. I don't even know what correctly means. Um, and they're often seeking guidance from people, oftentimes for weeks, it takes a long time. And then they come back and then send me revisions that they made. And it's like, well, I didn't actually say that. And that's not exactly what I meant. And now like it's taking longer because they're seeking guidance from people who aren't in the room and then we're not collaborating with this, you know, mysterious third person. And oftentimes when we talk about signing things, I'm getting like a 40 page document and they're not even redlined. So I don't even know what's changed. Um, so it, it's hard to be collaborative when they're making decisions with, you know, without me and my child in the room. And I can't even find the differences very, uh, very easily. 
Thank you for sharing that. I do know that we are working with people. It, it's kind of that comfort level, really trying to get them comfortable. We've tried to really reach out my team to get people to feel more confident, confident about that, doing this this new way uh, and really finding those ways to standardize that. Like, again, to Amy's point earlier, signing things, we have to know what we're signing um, and making sure everyone's on the same page. So I know we're working really hard to close the gaps on revisions. And I think your point is similar about knowing what changed. Like, how do I focus on just what has changed without having to read through the whole document? So we will continue with that. Um, yep. yep. My county currently says Britco does not allow for redlining. Um, I had to actively ask for an ADA accommodation for my own disability for them to provide me redlined copies via email. They would not do it unless I had asked for like protected rights. And it took like a couple weeks to process. Like it, it, <laughs> it was work. <laughs> um, and yeah, just, uh, and, and I think, so like in, in like IEPs, obviously not part of DODD, but they make decisions in the room where it happens. And, you know, they don't go off and go to some secret room and like change the way you worded it for some unknown reason. It doesn't build trust. Can I, can I, ask, can I ask a question, please? What county are you in working with your county. staff? On? Lucas County. Okay. That's interesting because I'm going to give you an example. My SAS in preparing this plan, it was one-on-one -on -one, continuously working. If she had a question, she would put me on hold even and come right back. And we devised this plan together. I could read the plan without looking at it because mostly my input was me because I'm familiar with the child. Right. So that only makes sense. Right. So it's who you're working with. Your, your SAS has to, this is just me. I'm just saying, has to come up to par and devise this plan with you one-on-one. -on -one. And if there's a question they're not sure of, we all stumble upon that. We're human. But that question should be answered immediately. And the yeah. plan then, as far as creating it, comes right back together that day. That's how your plan's devised. It sounds like somebody is overworked or maybe too much going on and they jump and jump and jump. They finally get your answer and go, oh, I got to get this plan done. And they put it in there to get the plan done. And you're still waiting to see if they had devised it in any way. And right. you get it completed to sign. And you're like, wait a minute. I don't recall that. Right. And even, it's your yeah. staff. It's even, your yeah, and even the time that's passed, they'll say, oh, I'll get back to you in two days. It is never two days. It's never immediate, right? But it's never just two days. It's often like up to like even 20 days. I mean, it's for them to reach out and then get the guidance and then they don't give me the guidance. And so I don't know why they worded it that way. And then they don't really know why they worded it that way. They just said, Mary over in this department said to do it this way. Like it's, it's problematic for people, but it's also problem problematic for processes. Like this is this is taking like it's gumming up the works and it's creating a lot of extra work because of these back and forth and how long it takes and then more questions. Thank you so much, Heidi. I'm uh, sorry to hear about this this situation. I know that. Um, every family's experience is different. Like Catherine said, thank you for that uh, suggestion. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, families do. You know, the, my SAS, I'm sorry, is remarkable. She's remarkable. She also <laughs> has a workload, but she's on top of it. But this is our second SAS because our first SAS to me, and I'm not trying to be cruel to anybody, wasn't a great fit for me. So I asked for her to be replaced. And my Everything's been rolling beautifully ever since. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank it. you so thank you so much for sharing your experience. I do appreciate it. Every family, every uh experience, every individual is is unique. Different. And that's what yes. I love about the Ohio ISP. So um I, I would love to take more questions and address uh your your uh concerns directly, Heidi. So um, unfortunately, we have a very packed schedule, and I want to get to 
a lot of the great information. So thank you, Beth, so much. Um, I would love to hear more about that training and um, just the new things that are coming along for the Ohio ISP. So thank yeah, you for your for time sure. today. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I am going to pass the conversation along to our Medicaid division. Um, so I have Nyoka's name on here. However, it is actually Ms. Jillian Carlson who is going to be sharing some updates on waivers and some other things. So um, thank you, Jillian, for being here today. Great. Thanks, Meredith. I appreciate uh, being here and having everybody's time. Um, I did already go ahead and drop something in the chat, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, I cannot chat and talk or drop a link and talk at the same time. So, so uh, I wanted to go ahead and, and uh, do that before I started. Um, we have made some proposed changes uh, to all three of our waivers. That's the level one, the self, and the IO waiver um, for to be effective January of 2025. What I have dropped in the chat is just a reminder for folks that those are still today up for public comment. Um, the public comment period ends September 29th. Um, so there's still plenty of time for folks to review those um, and, and make any comments that you would like. So I have the link in the chat will take you right to um, the page on our website, which shows you the summary for the waivers, as well as to the right, the uh, all the all of the you know full details. Um, to highlight uh, the things that we have made some proposed changes to are non-medical transportation, and this is typically transportation for folks um, to day services, employment, and things like that. Um, but we have proposed a special rate for non-medical transportation that is taking people to community integrated employment opportunities. Um, we have added back in um, for January of 25, the healthcare assessment service. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that we had it in for July of 24, um, but CMS had a number of questions. Um, so we did remove that so we could move forward with the other items that had been proposed. Um, but the healthcare assessment service is now back in for a proposed start date of January 25. Um, and then we made a very small tweak, if you will, to environmental modifications. Um, it is it is similar to what we did with specialized medical equipment. Um, both specialized medical equipment and environmental mods have a per item cap of ten thousand dollars. CMS wanted us to add some language um, that we would work with county boards and individuals um, to address situations whereby that piece of equipment or the environmental mod might be over $10,000 um, and, and how we would work through that with folks um, for things that were indeed medical necessity um, and important for folks. So we um, you know, have made that same language tweak um, for, the, for the upcoming waiver because we were pretty sure CMS was gonna ask us about it anyway. Um, so the public comment um, period is through September 29th. And then um, you know, we will take that feedback in, in, into consideration and then we will send those um, waiver amendment requests to CMS for a proposed start date of January of 25. Um, and then you know, the ball keeps on rolling. So we are already talking about things for July of 2025. And that is when we would need to renew the self waiver. Um, all of our waivers renew every five years. Um, so we will certainly have the self waiver renewal in July of 25, and along with some IO and the IO and level one amendments to include some things that we're working on for the, those dates, which would be um, possibly separating out vehicle mods to be its own standalone service. Um, we're working closely with the Ohio Department of Medicaid on that issue. Um, phase two of some waiting list assessment stuff. There's been some rule work happening with the waiting list assessment, and this would um, further that um, work. Um, we are looking to possibly stand up the basic employment skills training program, which sort of would take the place of vocab as we know it today. Um, these are things that have, have been, you know, uh, part of the blueprint work, um, and as well as some stuff on group employment. 
And then we will be taking a look also at remote supports as well as assistive technology. And again, those are you know proposed dates of, of July of 25. Um, some of what we encounter is the system work behind some of the changes that we make. Um, you know, very often the behind the scenes work um, sometimes takes six to eight months. So so while we may prepare or want to, you know, propose something for a particular date, sometimes we're sort of bound by the systems um, that we work in and, and kind of have to work at their pace occasionally. Um, and then just kind of way out there is July of 26. Um, and that's when we would need to um, work on the um, the uh, level one is due for its renewal at that point. Can you repeat um, the list of uh, things that you're working on for this July of 25? Sure, uh, vehicle mods, basic employment skills training. We, it's kind of called BEST, but I'm trying my I'm trying my best not to use acronyms um, and group employment. Um, phase two of the waiting list assessment changes and assistive technology and remote supports. And just to jump in really quickly, thank you, JoLynn. Uh, yeah. I know you have some more to, to share probably, um, but if you could send that information, I've been taking notes here myself uh, because mm -hmm. it's exciting to hear all of these great things. Uh, if you wouldn't mind after the meeting, uh, sending a list just so folks can have Sure, that and again, very, very clearly, these are proposed possibles. I mean, nothing is engraved in stone. A lot of this really depends on, you know, system work and, and what we are indeed able to, you know, stand up along with our partners at ODM. Because while we have system work here at DODD, and these are things like billing codes and things like that, they interface with um, all of the systems at ODM, which is the Ohio Department of Medicaid. So, you. you know, we are not always our own, you know, we, we have a lot of a lot of moving parts <laughs> to, right. to work on standing some of these items up. Absolutely. And what suggestions do you have? Uh, I know folks are, uh, often ask how to um, get involved or how to share their information. Uh, do you have suggestions on- Certainly. You know, the and I will put this in the chat as well. The waiver feedback at dodd.ohio.gov waiver mailbox um, is certainly a, a spot to you know for folks to put in some suggestions. We have had you know people asking about participant directed goods and services, you know, which is not in the IO waiver. We've had people talk about support brokers, which is not in the level one or IO waiver as well. So again, you know, people. You know, there are a number of things that people throw out there um, and, and they are welcome to send those suggestions to waiver feedback at dodd.ohio.gov. And I'll I'll drop that in the chat as well. Are those items, the participant directing goods and services, is that on the radar at all, even for like a five year plan? Like, is there any whisperings? Yeah, I mean, I think people have made some suggestions. I know people would like to have it in the IO waiver. Um, and certainly there's conversations about, you know, in the level one, there's a $2,500 cap. So I know people have asked about and, and you know, sent some feedback about that as well. So, so those are things that are, you know, always, you know, being suggested and, and you know, the team will take a look at what, what, is, what is able to get done in the amount of time that we have. Thank you, Joel. You're welcome. Uh, I don't want to get have, that. We no, were, sorry. We, did you have other updates that you wanted no, to give No, that us? was really that. And certainly once we, you know, get a little bit closer um, to the January 25 um, date, once our things get submitted to CMS, we will again, of course, create resource documents um, around the healthcare assessment. There'll be a recorded webinar, um, you know, frequently asked questions um, for all of those items. Um, you know, obviously we will make sure we get our, you know, all this information to SSAs who of course are your, you know, link to, to uh, your service plan document and, and needs assessments for folks. Um, but once we get that information, you know, closer to, um, we will, you know, get resource documents out and those will be posted on our website, um, you know, through Memo Monday and, and uh, sent out, of course, to the county boards. Great. Yeah, thank you. So for folks, Memo Monday is one of our uh, publications um, that we send out to, you You know, anybody can subscribe. We'll talk about subscribing to some, mm -hmm. some things later. Um, but 
yeah, we, we love to share information and I love mm -hmm. the conversation today for sure. So thank you, Jalen, for your time today and mm -hmm. all of the updates. You guys are so busy. So. Yes. Yes. We keep on revolving, like just a revolving one, moving from one, uh, you know, set of uh, waiver amendments to the next. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to move our conversation along. I love all of the feedback. Please keep sharing and asking questions. Um, and Corey, please be my eyes to jump in with some questions as well uh, with the chat. So thank you. Hey, Meredith, real quick, we do have a question from sure. Catherine about is a bathroom tub inclusive with any modifications available now? And I was just typing in the chat, Corey, um, environmental Sorry. modifications um, is a service in the IO waiver, um, but people do use participant directed goods and services um, in the self waiver um, when they're, you know, it, it, as envir if envir because environmental mods is not a service there. Um, so certainly work with your SSA um, to talk about, um, and I, I can't remember, I apologize if you said a son or daughter, um, their needs and, and um, you know, what direction you may um, want or need to take. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question. Uh, keep them coming. So, um, Corey, is there any other questions in the chat right now? Thank you. If there are questions that come up later, please feel free to email us at Ohio Life First Nexus, and we will pass the information along to our colleagues. Um, so I'm going to hand the Oops. conversation. Oh, sorry. I'm going to hand the conversation over to uh, Keith Banner, our community life engagement specialist. Um, so, Keith, did you want to go ahead and share your own slides? That's what I'm doing. I hope it worked. All right. I'm going to start the slideshow if I can. Thank you. Appreciate it, Meredith. I'm Keith Banner. I'm with the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. I am the project lead for community life engagement, which is um, our um, team of folks. Um, we have six project managers that um, help run and, and drive the um, employment first and technology first initiatives. And we're also involved in a lot of um, um, transition related kind of services and supports to help people move from school to adult and life. And we have a main focus on employment and technology. I just wanted to start with, um, we had a, through a contract, we were able to in, um, increase the um, access to digital literacy and moving from uh, to adult healthcare modules on our website, the Employment First website. And I wanted to take us there to that um, site so you can see the actual um, modules. So hold on a second and I'll get us there real quick. I had it up and now it's not there anymore. Here it is. I like to show um, the actual thing I'm talking about off. Um, these are the modules. It's on the Employment First website. We have a community um, life guide and a job seekers guide. And these two modules have been added. Um, Keith? Yes. It is still showing your like community life engagement slide. I don't know if you think that if the, I don't know if you have to re-screen share to pick the modules. Yeah, I'm, yeah, sure. I'm going to, let Thank me you. give it a try now. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for telling yep. me. Yep. Do, you, do, you, do you guys see it now? Yes. Okay, cool. This is the actual um, site, the Employment First website, and that we have a community um, life guide and a job seekers guide. And these two module or these two um, sessions are available now: building financial and digital skills, and then moving to adult healthcare. And basically, you can use these modules. People can um, access them on their own. Families can use them. Schools, providers to kind of guide discussion and also learning. And we're really um, Happy to be able to kind of introduce them to you. And they're for free. So obviously you can access them anytime you want. This module um, goes into deep detail around as people move from um, pediatrician to adult healthcare, what that what does that take and all the information you need for that. So I just wanted to kind of give you a taste of that. And you're welcome to obviously take a peek at that when you um, can. 
and I'm going to go back to my slide deck now. Nothing ever works the way I want it to, but I'm going to try. There we go. So hopefully I'm back on the slides. There's that one. Also wanted to talk about the adult day support quality pilot project that we've been working on since October, 2023. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I think we're not able to see your slides. I'm having a hard time. Um, so I'm going to depend on other folks. Uh, Can you see it? What about that? I can only see the title slide, Meredith. Right. Title yeah. slide. I'm so sorry, you guys. I don't know what's sorry. going on. Is it? I, I believe it's a great it. picture. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still showing my? Maybe it's showing mine. Okay. For now, <laughs> you are now to the adult day support quality yes. pilot project. Woo! Okay. So, I, I, so Keith, I believe it's showing my screen. Ah, uh, it's not showing mine. I don't think so. <laughs> it says it says you, it says you are screen sharing on mine. Are you guys seeing the adult day support quality project? I am. Yes, I am. Okay, it must be something, Mara, that's with yours, because everybody else, I think, is seeing the slides, hopefully. So um, I, I'm going to go ahead and go ahead, and, and if, if there's any other um, issues, let me know. But I was going to just talk briefly about the Adult Day Support Quality Pilot Project, um, which we started in October 2023 with 99 adult day support providers across the state, um, all different sizes, small, medium, and large providers that are kind of working on building their infrastructure to provide better quality services based on quality measures we've set up um, through stakeholder engagement. So basically the funding came from the American Rescue Plan money, ARPA money, and the funding was provided to the providers to pay for technology improvements and also um, to pay for staffing that each of the um, 99 have a version of a quality manager and staffing now that, and, and specific training around these quality measures we've set up. We're in the second phase now, the project ends in June. And basically from the initial year that we went into, they built a baseline around these quality measures around serving people with more complex needs, around um, a skill building curriculum, around staff training, uh, multiple um, um, ways to look at quality. And so they're now gonna be able to go in and report on those quality measures. And then we're gonna um, issue payments based on um, if they meet targets. So this is a pilot project to inform the work around improving that service because we've heard from families and other stakeholders that this is one of the services that really needs um, the most improvement. So we're working on that. We also have a project um, in um, collaboration with Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities um, to help support people who are in um, sub-minimum wage employment and shelter workshops or, or who are contemplating it to get the support they need um, to kind of look at moving into um, competitive integrated employment jobs in the community. So we have a staff person, a project manager, Melissa Morelli, who's leading that work for us. And we're now working with uh, um, 20 providers across the state. And we're um, I just recently had our first job um, person get a job through this project. So this is um, going to be lasting for um, four more years. So we hope to get a lot more people employed in the community through this project. Speaking of employment, we also used um, some of the ARPA-related funding to um, invest in our employment um, um, employment services providers across the state who provide services to our to um, people on waivers. So we were able to use um, some money to again help these employment services providers. Forty-three of them kind of invest in their own technology to increase um, efficiency and support of their DSPs, their job coaches and developers, and then also to use it to um, help them get credential, get training, and have the staff time to, to do that work. So that's working now. That'll be ending in December. We just met with four, all 43 of those providers, and they really had great stories about how that funding and that um, support and that infrastructure building is helping them to help people get jobs in the community. We also were able to use some of that funding to pay for new um, employment services related online courses for those job coaches and developers to improve their skills. We also have a bunch of other grant projects that I um, won't go into um, in a lot of detail, but we have 14 um, innovative technology solution um, grants that are um, working that run the range from supporting um, different um, endeavors around um, assistive tech and um, supportive technology. We also were able to award eight sites for regional technology hubs across the state. 
Um, basically, the regional technology hubs are now in all six superintendent regions, and their basic function is to support capacity building for families, individuals, um, providers, county boards, the community in, at large to kind of learn more about how supportive tech can be one of the solutions to people when they have needs that are that need to be met. So um, they're now all functioning, I think. And we have a link here, and and I'm not going to go to it because it was such a weird thing to get off the slide deck. So I'm not going to go to show you, but on the actual website, you can go and there's a heat map and you can go to that map and find the um, closest regional technology hub to you in your region. So you're welcome to do that once you get the slides and get the link. And then we also have four um, awardees around the Innovative Inclusive Supports Grant, which is supporting different um, providers to be more inclusive and think about people with complex needs in this way they deliver services. And we're providing funding to intermediate care facilities to purchase assistive technology for the people um, they support in the ICFs. We also are doing a transformative technology grant. There's a link here to the stories around that. Basically, we were able to use $2 million to fund really innovative projects that support better health outcomes and um, um, better provider um, support to um, increase those health outcomes and, and satisfaction with services. I'm going to just go to one of the out of those, um, I think there are seven or eight. Um, you can see the other ones at that link. This one, um, through IntellectAbility, we were able to um, fund a curriculum in um, for people with IDD, for um, clinicians, nurses, and doctors to go on and learn about the best way to support people with developmental disabilities um, in their practices. So that's an online learning course where they can get credentials. And, and um, then we also have a health risk screening tool that IntellectAbility has stood up that supports DSPs and provider organizations that support people in their homes to use a, um, this online tool to ensure that people are getting the kind of health care they need to, to move forward. And both those projects are now piloting. So we want to really pay attention at, at the end of the year because we'll have some results and be able to share that with you. We also have an internet assistance project that supports county boards who want to fund internet access to the people in their county. So we will reimburse those counties if they pay for that internet access because technology, of course, really depends on you know the access to the internet. So all of this stuff I'm talking about, especially around tech, we have a regular monthly um, tech update that comes out, like I said, monthly at the end of the month. You can subscribe to that and other um, DODD communications at this link. I'm trying to go fast because I didn't want to totally take all your time up. There's a lot of other stuff that I could talk about, but if you have other any other questions, you can always reach out to me. And then also at this link, you can see a team map for all of the community life engagement project managers in each region. Thank you. And I'll stop the share. Thank you so much. I apologize um, if there was some technical issues uh, with sharing. We do have all the links. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, and I'm not sure if they were shared along the way, but uh, you have a lot of great information and <laughs> I'm sorry we weren't able to see it all. Um, so I uh, does anybody have any questions for Keith right now? Um, and Corey, I don't know if you can share some of the the information that I can that, put some of those links in the chat too uh, that I was talking about. I'll go ahead and do that while while you guys are going on. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think it's it's great all of the work that you're doing and the way the um, ARPA funds are being utilized and bringing folk, folks into the workforce. Thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. <laughs> um can't see everybody. So if somebody has a question and they want to jump in, please feel free to. Thank you, Corey. Um, so thank you so much, Keith, for sharing all of that information. You did a fabulous job sharing so much and just a short amount of time. So thank you. Um, and we look forward to seeing all the great things that are happening across the state for employment. 
Um, so as Keith mentioned, there are lots of opportunities to connect with DODD and learn about things that are happening. So connecting at these regional meetings is, or I'm sorry, these uh, quarterly meetings is, is always a great opportunity. But in the meantime, uh, we have a lot of um, newsletters that go out uh, for a lot of different opportunities. So for direct service professionals, for families, general updates, and we also have um, have information that's uh, from, from our director. Um, another great way to connect is through our podcast that is hosted by Nathan Turner, uh, our outreach and education coordinator. So uh, always a great conversation with, with Nathan. Um, before I hand the conversation over, I wanted to make sure, um, Amy, I see that you asked a question um about wait list assessments um that you're hearing that families and their county boards are making folks apply for the home ohio home care waiver and then taking a child's name off of the dd waiting list but if the child doesn't have a serious medical issue the child will be denied the uh i'm assuming your acronym is ohio home care waiver then back to square one with the dd system um, what resolutions are available for families in similar circumstances? So, um, uh, Jolyn, I yeah, I put an answer okay. in the chat. Yeah, please, uh, you can email Waiver Policy TA with the details, and you know we will get it to the right people to look up to to look up the details and figure out what was happening and address it with the county boards. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. It's hard to keep up with the chat, <laughs> lots of things happening, but thanks for being on top of it. So Amy, um, email or, you know, we'll get you guys connected. Um, so I want to take some time uh, for this last little bit that we have and uh, connect with our director, Director Kim Houck. Um, so this time is to focus on, uh, on larger questions, um, if you do have some specific issues which have come up during this conversation, we will get you connected to the right folks to answer um, your family's particular question. But your your experiences are so valuable to us, and I know that Director Haug is excited to hear from from everybody. So, Director, uh, I will pass it along to you. Thanks, Meredith, and hi everyone. It's good to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I, there were a few things that I was asked to share specifically about, and um, one of those is our new vision, mission, and values. So we're um, really excited. A few weeks ago, we were able to um, roll out um, some new language in, in this area, and um, we worked with many different groups, including families. We sent out stakeholders and asked folks for their input on, on wording and um, what resonates with, with you. And this is what we landed on. And um, we're proud of it. And we hope that you all are too. So our mission is to partner. And, and partner is a theme that you'll see throughout um, with people and communities to support Ohioans with developmental disabilities and their families in realizing their version of a good life. Um, our vision is that um, Ohio is the heart of opportunity and where we envision Ohio is the best place in the nation for people with disabilities to thrive. And then our core values, um, we chose three um, and that's inclusion, partnership, and respect. So, um, you know, we really do um, value you and the opportunity that I have to hear from you and hear what's needed, um, where the gaps are, and how we can support um, you, your families, and, um, you know, our providers. So, um, Again, I hope those those words and, and the vision and mission resonate with you, and um, we'll be excited to, to share those um, across the state over the next few months and years. 
Um, the last meeting, I believe that was in July, maybe, um, you all asked and talked a little bit about navigating um, the waiver process and how difficult it can be. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, make sure that you knew that we heard you and Meredith, Corey, Nate folks have been working on some resources to share. And I didn't know if someone wanted to share with the group um, where you're at with that. Sure, I'm happy to share. Um, like Director Huff mentioned, we heard you. Uh, it's very important for us to make sure that the information is not only available, but accessible. and easy for folks to uh, to navigate and, you know, you can have all the information, but you need to understand what information is available. So um, part of the engagement that we have with families is uh, a, a small group of folks called the Fam Family Advisory Council Core Group. And those folks uh, serve a two-year term and we call on them often to uh, give us input and as families of folks living with disabilities uh, and some people living with disabilities themselves, uh, I count on, on just the experiences and what happens. So we've been working alongside our Medicaid division to be able to um, to create a, uh, a document that's gonna be a lot easier. So we are very close to getting this completed uh, based on feedback on, you know, looking at different considerations, we're excited to, to see this rolling out and see the different ways in which we can connect with, with people across Ohio so that the uh, process is easier to understand. Thank you. Does anyone have any um, further suggestions or insights or anything to add to that? Yeah, are there hotlines for um, parents or individuals to call, you know, beyond, loop, you know, their, their county boards of DD to better understand the, uh, you know, the information that you do provide? Meredith, do you have a... Sure, I was <laughs> I was giving everybody else a, an opportunity. So um, Heidi, thank you so much for that question. I know that uh, you and I have been in contact a few times and um, I love the, the team that we work with and my colleagues, um, a, a lot of our colleagues have special specialties that they focus on. So, um, you know, we have folks on Beth Chambers team. If you have specific questions about the Ohio ISP, if you have specific questions about waivers and eligibility, I would lean on Jalen's team and Medicaid division. Um, so for specific questions, definitely um, reach out to us. And we have folks who are going to be the experts on those different areas. Yeah, and I have, you're right, I have tried to reach out to lots of team members at DODD, and um, I often find that they, they, answering my questions isn't always easy, or it takes a long time, like, it, it feels like maybe they're their job isn't necessarily dedicated to helping the individual and maybe they're geared more towards helping the agency and providing technical you know assistance and guidance there um i'm wondering if there's a way for you know individuals and you know advocates to have a way that they can have equal access to the information that agencies do um, especially during like even appeals processes or even before appeals processes, because there are very few uh, experts or attorneys or, you know, places to go that really know those answers um, as well as DODD or Ohio Department of Medicaid do. And it really is hard for families to, to go through those processes. Thanks for that, Heidi. I know, um, or at least I think you've been in contact with Lindsay here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yes. I think she's a great contact and I can certainly point you in the direction of a person if she can't answer your questions. 
Um, yeah, and Lindsay is, uh, she, <clears throat> she's helpful, um, you know, in, in a very uh, limited way. I mean, um, again, there is, it's not her whole job to answer questions, so it takes her some time. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, a lot of times I'm being told, like, I can't answer these things because you are in a, an appeal process or a decision has already been made. And that's hard because as an individual, you wouldn't know that you had to seek guidance until after a decision is made because you would have no idea what the county was going to decide. So, but they've also told me in the same breath that I can't call and get you know assistance to learn more about these rules, but the county board can. And that feels like inherently one-sided, you know, for families and especially when county boards choose not to. Even when you ask them to, they choose not to. So <clears throat> it's like, you know, I don't think that disabled people want to be right. I think they want the information to be correct. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can't find the correct answer from, you know, the uh, the governing agencies because we're in like a jurisdictional limbo, like that's really hard. And also it puts us in a place where we're not efficient and we are spending months on appeal processes to finally get to a DODD level of appeal to even get, you know, some of that guidance since we've been locked in, you know, as per this jurisdictional, you know, rules. So like we're wasting all of these resources and oftentimes time, you know, of the disabled person, um, it just, it breeds animosity. And it's, it's, it's a bummer because uh, like Ohio Department of Education, you can get a facilitator from Ohio Department of Education. You can call a hotline. You know, Ohio Department of Ed isn't like locked in saying, oh, well, if the school district decided something, like we can't really like answer any questions at all about the situation. Like they don't have those same restrictions. So it's, it's a clear difference of like what is equitable to both sides. Of in you know just information like why is it this way? So I'm sorry I can't answer your question today. I I don't know the answer. I don't want to like you said. I don't want to give you incorrect information. So I mean I'm happy to talk with you at a different time and um, you know see see how we can help. But yeah, and you know in this meeting I'm talking about like and because you're here and I'm so glad you're here that maybe there are other ways we can do this across the state so we are not wasting resources sure. in these horrible processes where we're building like really bad relationships with the people we want to serve like that's the opposite of your vision and mission so absolutely absolutely we don't want that so yeah it, i mean i guess i will just say if you have ideas or suggestions i know you mentioned od um uh, uh, Department of Education and Workforce now, which I know ODE, um, I, you mentioned how they do some things. So we can certainly look into that and, and see um, where we can make changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the so only there, thing, can I just add one thing? Yeah. Um, Heidi and to the director as well, if there are conversations through both this family advisory, F committee and through our Disability Connect really helps not only just understand what's going well and not going well um, for families, for you also, I just appreciate you sharing it. And if there are things that it leads to maybe us putting out more resources or more communication, it's just really helpful. So thank you um, for sharing. And so I just want to make sure, because I know our Ohio Life Course Nexus team and our Medicaid teams are working to make sure that we are sending out communications or trainings to both people and services and families. And so I'm hearing just want to circle in like maybe some additional resources on due process and kind of what that due process is, what it looks like. If there's anything that I missed, throw it in the chat so that we can make sure that we are creating some resources and trainings, Heidi, um, and we're definitely willing to do that. So if there's other topics um, that you all want to see us take on or that we need to take on, put it in there. And then if, continue to have these conversations as we have our meetings um, so we know what communication we need to get out and resources. So thank you. Thanks for letting me add that piece. Thank you, Stacey. And uh, yeah, just to further encourage, um, you know, 
I love that there's a lot of a lot of chat going on. And Heidi, I appreciate that you're sharing your experience. Um, you know, we want we want solutions. Uh, that's my role here is to find solutions and to help families. So um, we do take steps to try to reach out to folks and get information. So um, please answer those surveys. We really do look at them. We really do take action. Uh, come to these meetings, uh, attend the trainings. Uh, we're here to listen. So um, Corey, I know there is a lot going on in the chat. So if you could help me with catching up a little bit, um, I would appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem at all. I wanted to take some time to dive into some feedback we're hearing from Marissa, who had shared that there needs to be real help for families of non-speakers. And I wanted to learn more about what that meant and what, what your experience is and what you're looking for, if you're willing and able to, to unmute and, and share with us. It says she's trying. Let me see if I can unmute on my end, maybe. Did it unmute? You have. Thank you for okay. being here. Can you hear me clearly? You can. Okay. Thank you. I'm just up here on this call, buddy. Okay. I'm right here if you need me. Um, yeah, what I mean by real help for families of non-speakers is that I and my group of mom friends who are in the same um, kind of boat with high needs non-speakers, I'm not saying anything that's mean. I'm just letting these people know what our life looks like to try to get help, okay? I'm not talking bad or anything inappropriate. Um, I don't think that there's a good understanding of those of us who have non-speakers who have body dysregulation that can show up as aggression and self-injury. And um, there's not <laughs> there's not any help. Working with my SSA, I sent an email to her about, she asked what I would want listed in the portal for a provider. And I sent the email and she told me all these things that she couldn't include. And then she sent me screenshots of how she has my son in the portal. And while he does love music and has some favorite items, it's really not an accurate description of our needs. And so we keep going through this cycle of me having to try to find providers and then it not working out. Um, I, they're grossly, um, incapable of handling the situation. I do have one provider who I've had for five years, but she had stayed with us. She started at my son's old school, did HPC. She um, went through the independent provider program specifically to stay with us because she has that bond with my son and understands him. Um, she went three months without pay during that process because of the billing. I can't remember if it was and data or whatever. Um, but I'm really gravely concerned that there's the GED high school requirements are gone, um, that we're just going to be even more overlooked. And how many Trudy Sternagel situations does Ohio need to have before non speakers are noticed and valued as human beings, intellectual human beings? Marissa, thank so, you for sharing. Um, I wanted to ask, what county are you in? Summit. Summit County? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. I don't know, for some of you on the call, um, you know, Marissa, when you, thank you for sharing, and when you talk about putting the accurate information in the provider portal. I know that just to, for those of you who are in different counties, sometimes counties use provider portals to help find providers. Other times um, they don't. So in regards to how 
a county board goes through like assessing the needs and connecting with the provider, the experiences may be different across the state. So um, I know Marissa, you mentioned the biggest, you know, concern is that, you know, the information isn't accurate. So you aren't getting connected with that right provider um, because yeah. of that provider, the provider portal. And um, I feel like the um, IP program, the inter independent provider program, I feel just as bad for the providers who are people who are genuinely wanting to do this work. I'm in the groups, I'm in support groups, and the heck they go through trying to get registered, trying to do everything, um, it's really, really ridiculous. And like you said, it's a waste of resources, a waste of time and money. Um, I think that coming from an education background, there really needs to be an overhaul of the IP program. I think it would make a lot of sense for there to be some kind of education that providers would need to obtain something that that there is oversight with some kind of, um, you know, disability organization to make sure that this person, you know, is becoming an IP and they know that these are best practices for body safety in the physical sense, the emotional sense. Um, this is how we keep a non-speaker's dignity, you know, and it would go over all those different things. And then um, something, you know, that it just shouldn't be our most precious, valuable people in our lives. Our children are just handed off to anyone. I've felt very much these past few years as my son has gone from early childhood to middle school age that, um, and I'm not saying this, buddy, to hurt your feelings. I feel like um, my local DD just thinks my child is like a deep fryer. And they're like, well, what's your most pressing concern? What's the biggest issue? The biggest issue is that you're not seeing me. You're not seeing the other non-speakers. You're making us jump through hoops with ethics committees so that children with seizures can still wear a helmet so that when they drop with a seizure, they don't get a head injury. That makes no sense. And that's putting stress on parents who are already stressed. Why would you take away, why would you make someone jump through a hoop and prove they need this helpful thing for their child? I was told by my SSA in an email that it couldn't be listed that a person needs to have the physical um, capability to assist me with lifting my son if he were to have a um, meltdown in a public place and I need to take him out to the car. She said that would be a violation of my son's rights and that I would have to go through an ethics committee to even be able to have that listed in the portal that somebody needs to have the physical capabilities to assist with my son. I had one lady from an agency when I was trying uh, that out. She came out. She couldn't even raise her arms above her head because she had a medical condition, um, hydrogenitis, and it causes like these sores. Um, I had another person from that same agency who was checking on her own autistic child on her phone with cameras while she was working with me. Nobody can provide what my child needs if their own needs aren't met, if they're not in a place to provide this level of care. And the, in my opinion, the only way to know if a person is at a place where they can provide this level of care is to offer the education they need to provide that level of care. Oh. The, I, I think compensation increasing, I think that's great. I I believe that people who um, help our families to, and who are good people, they deserve that compensation and they deserve to not have to go without pay or not knowing when their pay is coming and um, that type of thing. That has also been something that has been a roadblock with developing a relationship with an IP that could be retained is because they're you know, telling me, well, when am I going to get paid? When am I get paid? This isn't like Cuyahoga County. I got, you know, put on the person's case. I met you six weeks ago and things, and I'm still not on your son's case to start working. I have bills to pay. I, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm a single mother. I, I couldn't 
pay him out of pocket until he started getting paid. And I don't think that's something that should be put on me. There's a lot of stressors with your resources and your paperwork and your assessments and all of these things that are not beneficial to the family. Marissa, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and the feedback that you have about kind of what's happening for you um, and other families. It is incredibly helpful. I just want to summarize a couple of things because I'm trying the same thing as Meredith to keep up with the chat and to keep up um, with kind of what we're being shared with. So I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to circle back with what I'm hearing just to kind of some areas, if that's okay. And sure. you can just tell me if we're kind of, if I'm understanding so that our teams can talk it through and and decide and discuss kind of those next steps. So one I've got, and this is I think Heidi's piece, but also yours, Marissa, we need to just do more to give you all information and other families around rules and laws, kind of what's currently in place, why is it in place, what does that look like? And then of course, you know, we can talk about kind of our you know, rulemaking processes and ways to give feedback and how you can do that and how to be aware of it. So I've got some kind of rules and laws piece I'm hearing some compliance and monitoring questions of kind of what does that, how are you monitoring? What does that look like in regards to like oversight um, and, and why? I've got some provider certification components and what it looks like for independent providers, agency providers, and really having conversations in that space around provider certification. So we can talk about what happens, what's kind of from an administrative perspective, what's happening now right? And then we can identify where there's trouble. Because sometimes, again, I do think there is, we identify or we hear something that might be an internal process versus like a kind of statewide process. So I've got provider certification and those topics, trainings and trainings, whether it's requirements or offerings to both independent providers and agency providers. And so what trainings do we have? What trainings are priority? And how do we do more of that? And then again, just kind of more. It needs an overhaul. the trainings need an overhaul. They're not okay. appropriate. Okay. If there is um, specific ones that you know that you've seen um, that you'd like some revisions on, there is. I mean, we've got so when you say trainings, there's lots of different places my mind goes. So um, I think giving the us whole program. I mean, I would love to speak with the director of the IP oh, program okay. and discuss what I think are. Um, huge issues and huge liabilities mm -hmm. on your guys' end. Uh, it's not acceptable for our families. And the fact that I feel like I'm being placated, like, oh, we'll make sure that, you know, you know, the rules and regulations or something's internal or something's statewide and all of that. And I'm saying you're not seeing us clearly to be able to implement appropriate things. We can't fill out two hour questionnaires that you can look at and do that. You're not hearing from the families in dire situations because they don't have the free time to fill that out and to go into detailed length. Right. Um, and Stacy, I'm going to jump in. I dropped um, the Ohio Life First Nexus email in there. I would love to connect with you. Um, I hear you completely, families are stretched thin. Um, there are several several folks in, in our system that our families are people living with disabilities as well. So I, I hear you and I understand, but I, I, wanna, I wanna help you and I wanna get you connected to the right folks. Yeah, I think maybe the state auditor might be one of them because I really do have concerns um, what happened to Trudy Sternagel and Skywalker in 2009. Um, I, where are all the children who needed intense services 10 and 15 years ago? Where are they now? Are they still with their families? Or are they in residential placements where the money, federal money is going back to the state? I'm just being honest. I'm being completely transparent in my feelings. I don't know if things are being misappropriated or if this is generally, genuinely, people don't see what we're going through. Um, I know a lot of families like mine, you know, we don't want to say how hard it is because people always think that there's a resource or a solution. And so we just 
stop saying anything because there isn't, we know there isn't, and we know it's just going to stress us out more and take what little bit of energy we have for our kids from us. So we don't. So how are you going to help us if you can't see that we're struggling so much? We can't fill out your questionnaires and keep up with all of that that you say you rely heavily upon. And where are those non-speakers and others who receive those services? I would like to know. I mean, that data has to be somewhere. Their names, you know, what's the percentage that is with family or in a situation or in a home of their choosing. Marissa, thank you. I know we've got your contact information so we can have some more conversations that Meredith sounds good in regards to next steps. I'm hearing we need to add data um, to our conversations as well. So really helping um, all of you kind of identify and kind of form our next several like discussions in meetings and further conversations. Um, Thank I know you. I definitely have some more questions just to make sure when we talk about like some of the specifics that we're just on the same page of, you know, what we're asking and, and the struggles you're experiencing. So thanks. Yeah. Marissa. And that's like, that's sorry, just to one last thing. That's one of the things that I feel like our, our data isn't included when you guys are making decisions, like what our lives are and what can be offered because we're so bogged down because we're just getting by hour to hour, day to day, trying to do what we can for our kids and other kids. Um, so yeah, making sure that we're actually being seen and included. And then also, yeah, I would like to know where, where are those people now? Thank you, Marissa and Heidi and others for sharing. Um, I'm appreciative of that. Um, there's several people on the call today from the department and we will certainly go back and have conversations and think about um, different ways that we can support you and get you the information that you're asking for. Um, and thanks to Meredith and, and your team for hosting these calls and inviting me to attend. Can I just add very briefly, I want to thank Marissa wholeheartedly as a mom myself. I also know how advocating and speaking up today, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's emotionally draining. It can, but it's so important. So I just want to recognize her and her voice and your power. You are powerful when you feel powerless. And I just want you to know that I recognize that. And I'm so grateful you spoke up today. Um, and secondly, I want to back her up on some things that families have also been sharing with us at Ohio Family to Family. It would be great as a resolution to one of her um, ideas if we could see some standardization about what the job descriptions yeah. are, what families see as the job descriptions for the providers that they that their children need in the home, and what's put out on the portal. That needs to be standardized so that every county and SSA in the state uses the same version of a job description that is first driven by the family and the person who knows the child the best. Yeah, that, yeah. That would be the some outcome out of today's conversation that I'd like to just further highlight because it is something that families are coming to us about too. Like, how do I balance what the SSA did versus what I know my child needs? That's very important. Um, so somehow maybe coming up with that standardized 
option. But again, thank you, Marissa. You did great. Oh, thank you. I'm super, I was super nervous and I had just seen this and I would have been on sooner. But thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. I really do appreciate you listening. These meetings are so important to all of us here at the department. Um, we walk away with lots of uh, information and this is what shapes our, our work. Um, I wouldn't be here right now doing this if it wasn't uh, a need that we wanted to fill. We want to hear you. Um, so just showing up to the meeting is is huge. So we appreciate you very much. Um, Marissa, yes, thank you for being so brave and, and sharing. Um, I'm a parent as well, um, and I know how difficult it is. So, um, so thank you. And thank you, Amy, also for those suggestions. Um, I, I would love to connect, you know, we always connect. So um, please give me a call and we, I want to hear more about the standardization. Um, so, yes. Um, so in that same vein, I know we're a little over our time. Uh, December is the next time that we meet, but please feel free to reach out to me, to my team. I don't have all the answers, uh, but I know the folks who will have the answers. Um, so I can get you guys connected to the right folks. And um, I appreciate your time today. And thank you so much, Director, for, for your time and, and answering and spending time with us today. So thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.